All right. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Matt. How are you? I'm very good this morning. I actually woke up a little early, so uh, I, 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 I'm, I've had time to settle in into my exhaustion. All right. Cool. Did you rest up? Uh, I, I'm a little sleep deprived, but I, like I said, I've been <laughs> up for enough. I've been enough. I've been, I've been up for enough that I, long enough that I've settled into the. Okay. Uh, so, so the blood's flowing. I've accepted my fate, and so I, I, I move forward. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, saying that you're a little sleep deprived, I think that might be an understatement uh, these days. But you know, uh, at some point, uh, somebody uh, will have. Um, uh, written some summary of these last uh, three months of your life, and and uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll uh, gain a greater understanding of of your sleep deprivation. Uh, all right, well, but I'm very fortunate uh, that you are awake, uh, and I'm very fortunate to be awake uh, along with you uh, today, and that we've been doing the work that we've been doing over the last. Uh, if, if this is a 12th episode and we've been doing these episodes basically once a week, uh, uh, we've been doing this for three months. Yeah. We've been doing it for, for, you know, a quarter of the, uh, <laughs> uh, of, of the year so far. Okay. Well, uh, I welcome you and I welcome other people. I'm glad to be uh, in your presence and uh, learning from you and learning from other people and uh, discussing uh, uh, capital and particularly chapter six, where we uh, turn our attention a little more uh, specifically, of course, uh, to uh, the commodification of labor. Um, I'd like to um, I'd like to begin um, uh, uh, today's discussion, Matt. Uh, with a short summary, a short summary that, uh, uh, you know, whose discussion uh, is useful uh, for folks to understand uh, what is essentially the point of chapter six, which is, as I said a few moments ago, the commodification of labor. Uh, but for understand this um, uh, commodification, uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, useful to to, to track where it is uh, we've been uh, to this point. And so I'd like to, I'd like to do that uh, over the next uh, two or three minutes. Uh, what do you think? Do it. Yeah? All right. So, so as I said, there's a set of uh, pre, uh, preceding understandings that serve as, as premise or a set of premises, right, for us to uh, 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 gain an understanding of the ways in which uh, work and the very capacity to work, right? The very capacity to work is 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 taken, if you will, to uh, the market, uh, taken to the swap meet. And I don't mean that uh, even, or rather, I don't only mean that metaphorically. Uh, those of us who have uh, uh, gone to uh, local uh, hardware centers, you know, uh, home centers, etc know that in fact people take their labor power to the market. Uh, in, in some countries, in fact, uh, they hold placards of their labor power and or their labor capacity. And, and, and then people, you know, uh, walk, walk among, amongst them as if they are looking at uh, produce uh, at market and select the one uh, that they believe is uh, is best suited uh, for their for their immediate needs. And so I I'd like to talk about uh, how that uh, comes to be. Uh, and so uh, to do so, of course, we need to understand what a commodity is, Matt. And a commodity, uh, as as I'll summarize it here, of course, is first and foremost the fruit of industrial the fruit of the industrial labor market in a capitalist economy. And this, of course, presupposes that there exists a division of labor, right, where uh, individuals are categorized, segregated, uh, inserted within uh, specific spheres of society, and they're in those particular spheres uh, have uh, specific tasks uh, 
to fulfill for the uh, capitalist uh, system to reproduce itself across uh, both time and space. And as, um, and as they are components, and now I'm referring to commodities in particular, you know, the proverbial coffee cup uh, that we've been talking about uh, over the last few months. And as, and as commodities are components, they contain within them elements that a science of the economy can disclose. A science of life discloses the components of animals and plants. And these components, right, are essentially three. The first one, of course, is use value. The second one is exchange value. And the third one, uh, somewhat uh, ambiguous uh, as far as our summary goes, is value. I'd like to um, underscore, in fact, that there's uh, a fourth element, a little more, um, a little more uh, abstract than the first three. And that uh, fourth element is the fact that these uh, categories of value exist um, uh, simultaneously within a single commodity. Hopefully we'll talk a little bit about this um, as, as we proceed. Anyway, but then getting back to this discussion of the components of, of commodities, Matt, as, as the components of a bird uh, are better understood by uh, biologists, uh, given the bird's presence on a branch or in flight, a commodities components are best understood in the market. In this case, Marx engages in a bit of alchemy himself, uh, a bit of literary alchemy, uh, Matt, uh, and conjures out of uh, quote unquote thin air a character. And he gives this particular character a name. He calls him uh, Mr. Moneybags, yeah. right? Whose insatiateness is to this point tracked and understood on the terrain and activities of the first circuit is the money commodity money circuit used to understand money bags relationships or re relationship with the owners of commodities and later consumers of commodities. We'll, you know, we'll get into this a little bit uh, uh, to the extent that we have time in a little while. There's a second, there's a second uh, circuit, Matt, and that circuit is the commodity money commodity circuit. And this, of course, is used to understand consumers' relationship with Mr. Moneybags. And finally, as far as this short summary is concerned, we see that as Moneybags makes his way across these circuits, he accrues what on first inspection is profit, but may later be distinguished as surplus value. Thus it is upon these circuits by way of these activities and on the basis of these components that the relationship between workers whose labor is consumed and commoditized and capitalists who consume labor is mapped. Um, what Marx has done uh, throughout the chapters that we have been reading uh, over the last three months or so is, um, you know, he's identified uh, the components uh, that are elemental, fundamental. He has um, uh, presented us with language with which we might understand, uh, you know, the, uh, the, various ways in which, um, uh, you know, uh, 
commodities come to be in the contemporary economy, and then in fact, how we come to be, right? Within the contemporary economy, um, it's a uh, somewhat of a, uh, I don't know, uh, an iron cage, if you will, to make reference to uh, another uh, uh, scientist of society, another sociologist. It's, it's a way to understand how it is we um, uh, exist and how it is uh, that we are produced as, as, um, as elements of a society that has existed uh, before Matt, you and I, you know, uh, started to breathe. Uh, I'll stop there for a little bit so that we can uh, discuss it for a little bit, and then we'll get into like the, what I think is the thick of this particular chapter. What do you think? Well, I mean, you're talking a lot about uh, you know commodities and, and and you know the commodification of um, you know I mean talking about commodification and the society we live in, which is based around the exchange of commodities and exchange of like our, our labor for commodities, um, our labor into commodities, yeah. our labor, you know, our yeah. And so I think I think what's really um, you know, I remember talking to a, an old, uh, an older, uh, older generation communist. And they were telling me that um, there was a moment where this person had a revelation that they were talking to. Mm -hmm. They said they got it that you know GM doesn't make cars; they make dollars, right? Yeah. Well, in the same in the same sense that GM doesn't make cars, they make dollars. The workers at GM don't make don't make cars; they make value, right? Yeah. And they make value by by selling their labor power, yeah. and um, See, see, there's a there's a distinction, and I'll, I'll maybe get into this later between labor power and labor. Yeah, and I've seen many, many, many Marxists make this mistake of of not making that distinction, and then when they lose that distinction, and it sounds jargony, it sounds like you're just you're just you're you're just uh, nitpicking, or you're just uh, trying to just uh, aha, I got you. But no, it's really actually important distinction, and the reason it's an important distinction is because your labor is what you imbue into the commodity. That is like once you've been hired. Yeah. Right, uh, um, that is actually what where where the where the value is like is is injected into the commodity, whether the commodity is a lamp, a cup, a car, etc. Right, that is where um, that is that is from whence the commodity. Yeah, that is where the commodity gets it. It's like you know, like that's like a pumping steroids into your arm. Right, your 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 labor is the steroids you're putting into arm. Right, so like that is how um, a, a value gets into the commodity is through your labor, but you don't sell your labor. You sell your labor power as Marx put it right now. That's kind of a weird way of talking that we don't really talk that way anymore. So what really is, is your, your labor capability, your ability to labor. That's what we're talking about. Your labor ability, your ability to do something. You're selling the fact that you can do something, right? So let's take like a boxing match, right? A boxer is selling their labor power, their ability to box, right? And in, in the night of the fight, they are applying their labor <laughs> to, uh, onto their opponent, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they didn't sell. They don't. They, they didn't sell the punches. They sell their ability to punch, yeah. right? They didn't walk up to the promoter and just knock them out. They, 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 they're, they're selling their ability to knock somebody out, right? So that's kind of like what that means, right? That, that, that the distinction between labor and labor power, and that is actually really laid out really well in this chapter. I mean, that's yeah. the I most come to when I, when I think about this chapter, and I think it's you know it's a short chapter. It's very it's it's it's, it's really concise and where. But um, unlike chapter five and four, which is going over the same thing, this is <laughs> this is actually this is actually this chapter is really distinct and very important. Chapter six, um, but you know to, to get into some of the stuff that you were talking about, with, you know the money uh, commodity circuit, um, you know that that's kind of um, that's kind of the basis of our lives, and it's kind of a world we're born into, and and it's invisible to us in many ways because yeah. we think it's just the way it is. You know, you got to work to live, you got to like do this, you got to pay the cost to be the boss, you got to like you know, um, you know. You have you. This is just you know. Should that be free? You know, should be should, should you know like should a dentist trip be free? Should a haircut be free? You know, these people have to work. They, you know, like what are you talking about, right? And um, in some ways, this is what's what's interesting though. The, the the when we talk about like exchange value, right? So exchange value in a capitalist system takes on a very takes, it's very nefarious. And the reason it's nefarious is because there is um, within this circuit somebody that is robbing it, right? Somebody that is is is, is yeah. picking, is, see, there's like a, a, a division of labor, right? And and Marx very much deeply believes in a division of labor, and the deep believes that division of labor improves human life, right? And I think that is actually you know readily um, evident 
that a division of labor not only improves human life, it extends human life. We live longer because we are in a community, right? Just, just generally speaking, right? Whatever that community be. We live longer um, through each other's uh, collective efforts, right? So there is something to be said. I mean, this is what distinguishes it from like libertarians or even anarchists, right? The, the, the fact of the matter is that a division of labor is good. And what Marx describes that we need to break away from is a stultifying division of labor, meaning like we are like just like animatrons just doing certain things against our will, totally coerced, so that someone else might get rich, right? And so that is what's really happening when we describe this circuit is that somebody is like picking out of the process. Like there's this process, right, that is actually extending and making human life better because we are in community, because we are working together, it's making life better. Because like I'll do this, you do that, you do that. It makes no sense for me to do everything. It makes no sense for you to do everything. I'll do this, you do that. And so that that's kind of good. So even in a planned economy, you'd still have something, I don't know if we'd call it exchange value, but you'd still have something like exchange value because a pen is not going to cost as much as a car, right? Even in a planned economy, you know, I mean, there's still a certain amount of labor that went into this one pen versus the amount of labor that went into a car. Yeah. You know, which might have required a few people to produce it, right? I, I doubt one person did it. So that's still going to, there's still going to be something, an acknowledgement that more human labor went into that car than went into this pen, even in a planned economy, right? And so um, there would be something like exchange value, like, or like we are like our understanding of exchange value, but it wouldn't be with somebody robbing it blind. And that, that is kind of the world we live in, the world where um, our efforts and our time and the energy we put into things to make one another's lives better, right, is being um, mined uh by these by this 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 group of of, of nefarious uh um vampires yeah known as, known as the capitalists yeah there's a you know this distinction that you were talking about uh and the distinction that i make also at the outset of, of the summary i i also think is important um and uh, you know i just uh i just want to share that never was this distinction uh, about which we've been talking, most visible to me than uh, when uh, I took a trip to Mexico City. Um, I'd never seen this before. At least I'd never been uh, uh, attentive to, to this particular distinction. Um, you know, by comparison to the way that labor is taken to the market, say to a local home center, for instance, uh, when labor is taken to the market, in this case, when labor is taken in Mexico City, uh, when labor is taken to the plaza, to the central plaza, uh, you know, when labor is taken uh, to the steps of some cathedral in some city or in some town in Mexico, for instance, or in any other Latin American, you know, capitalist uh, Latin American country, uh, what happens is that literally somebody puts a sign you know, uh, 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 creates a sign for himself or creates a sign uh, uh, for herself and identifies what he or she is capable of doing. And so it's in that moment that the sale is taking, it's rather, it's, it's in that moment that the selling of labor power, right, is, is, is activated. What is interesting uh, as far as this chapter is concerned is uh, and and it's really going to make sense as far as the incursion of the merchant class, the incursions and the penetrations that bankers are able to exercise in the economy, right? Uh, for Marx to really get into that particular subject later on in the book, um, he needs to underscore in chapter six that uh, the payment for labor now not for labor power necessarily, but, but for labor itself, doesn't take place until labor, until, until labor is rendered, I'm sorry, rendered, right? And, so, and so, that, so that I have a capacity to work and that is what I am in the process of selling, right? And then that, that isn't sold until the exercise is complete, right? Um, and that there's something else that's very important, and we'll be talking about this in just a few moments, is that um, that there are a set of conditions that must exist, historically speaking, for that exchange uh, to take place. And a primary among the primary conditions for that to, you know, for that um, 
for that exercise or for that practice, for that sale to take place is that uh, the worker must be quote unquote free, right? Um, as opposed to enslaved, right? Uh, that the uh, consumer of the work and the consumer of labor power, or the, the consumer of labor capacity must not be as it were um, an enslaver, right? He must be, or she must be uh, a, a capitalist. Um, I guess I guess now would be a good time to, to go to a quote that I'd like to share uh, from chapter six, um, Matt. And I'd like, uh, I'd like to share it with you and I'd like to, to get your thoughts about it, okay? And uh, the quote goes like this. Uh, In order to be able to extract value from the consumption of a commodity, our friend Moneybags must be so lucky as to find within the sphere of circulation in the market a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value, whose actual consumption, therefore, is itself embodiment of labor and consequently a creation of value. The possessor of money does find on the market such a special commodity in capacity for labor or labor power. I think that what you were talking about earlier in your conversation with uh, an older gentleman and um, uh, a communist uh, might help to, you know, uh, bring uh, these words uh, to flesh. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was in a position at the time where we were, we were presenting papers within an organization, you know, this whole thing. And um, uh, I remember I was doing I was doing some work on this concept of the difference between um, what we would call um, kind of like the you know social relations of production yeah. versus um, actual technological capacity and how like we would talk about like maybe like property relations versus like the concept of like productive, the actual relationship between people and and and, and that and how like these kind of lines were breaking. But someone else was doing stuff on labor and and labor power and I remember that 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 that, that this real like was very contentious because. Um, the person was not making distinction between labor and labor power, and that became this huge like um, I don't want to say yeah I'll say it um, doesn't matter I mean like you know we, we write papers to to, to we, we don't we don't write things not to be scrutinized so yeah. like so they were they were <laughs> they wrote this thing and they didn't really make the distinction between labor and labor power and that became uh, you know almost like when you make a mistake on um, when you make a mistake uh, let's say you were like you know writing. Um, Mm, let's say we're like working on math, right? And uh, and you made a mistake early on the board. It's gonna like appear later on the board. You know what I mean? It's gonna that that mistake is not going to. Um, you're not gonna be safe from uh, from that mistake uh, on the board there. So um, yeah, so that was a real issue. So so this distinction again to be made between labor power and 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 what is labor. I mean, it, it's 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 crucial because. I mean, it, it sounds theoretical and kind of pointless almost, but but the the, the point is that um, one has to do with your ability to survive, right? And the other has to do with how and why things are made, right? And like, and the fact of the matter is like, the fact of the matter is that you're 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 the the how thing when, when things are made, they're in, in the, the 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 variable in the production, right? Not the not the land, not the resource, whatever the variable is your labor. Like that is from where, um, however less you are paid is, is, is the rate of profit that the capitalist is going to draw. Right. And that is the, that, and that is the basis of your value. And that is the basis of exchange value as a basis of what we call surplus value, um, is labor. And so, um, but that is not, that's the, 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 how things are sold in the market is different from like how you're going to like live and die. Like why you are proletariat is based on the fact that you must sell your labor power, right? Why a commodity has value is based upon the labor that is imbued within the commodity itself. Yeah. Well, um, so uh, since you said these things, I think it's, I think it's useful that we uh, talk about or that I, you know, that I, that I identify uh, uh, 
what these what these conditions are, you know, um, and 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 I'm talking about the ways in which um, uh, the conditions that are required for uh, labor to be a commodity, much like you know uh, this pencil is a commodity, you know what are the what are the uh, conditions uh, that would equate my existence, your existence, and other people's existence? Uh, uh, what are the conditions that would equate our existence with this? Right? Marx gets into that. You know, Marx gets into that. Uh, and of course, the first. Uh, uh, of the six that I will identify here, the first one, of course, is that the worker sells her labor power as a commodity in the market. The second one, and of course, I mentioned this just a few moments ago, uh, the worker must own her labor. And the third one is that uh, this is a temporary sale. It's not permanent. It's it goes from, as it were, from gig to gig to gig and to gig. Uh, I think I'll make a parenthetical uh, comment here. Um, it seems as if, in fact, it's the case that um, the gig economy uh, in which many people find themselves today um, is, is uh, an aspect of labor that had existed in the 19th century, given that Marx is writing about labor um, in the 19th century. Uh, and it, it brings to mind the importance uh, and the significance of the labor movement, uh, even, even in its um, more liberal aspects, uh, as opposed to radical aspects, in other words, it, it sheds light on uh, the gains that uh, labor, uh, organized labor was able to uh, obtain for itself. You know, of course, uh, I'll ask you to speak to this in, in a few moments. In its capacity to, uh, well, for, for some to gain permanence, right? To get a permanent uh, position at a particular workstation to gain a permanent presence at a particular set of workstations, to be able to uh, command to some extent the labor that takes place in these particular stations. Um, and of course now, of course, over the last 30 years or so, 40 years, of course, uh, that, uh, that these uh, capacities have been uh, sabotaged uh, by the capitalist class, by the political class, uh, this um, uh, this uh, uh, form of labor that had existed, you know, in earlier centuries, has has uh, surfaced again uh, uh, in spaces where it didn't exist over the last sixty years. Has surfaced again uh, uh, in some cases with vengeance. Uh, before I go on to the last uh, three points of these six points, uh, 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 Matt, would you like to make any comment about that? Well, again, I mean, see, this is why the distinction is so important because earlier you just said that that the uh, the worker owns her labor, right? So the proletariat owns her labor. No, they do. They do not. They own their labor power. That's true. That's true. It's their ability to labor. Their labor is actually surrendered once in once they enter into a relationship with the capitalist. And who <laughs> is the capitalist, the capitalist yeah. is the 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 capitalist is the one who can who owns the means of production. The capitalist is the one who owns. The production of commodity, whether that be the dollar or whether it be uh, a servants agency that sells people to go out and work or whether that be wh whatever that commodity is, they're the ones who own the, the commodity production process, right? So that is the capitalist. The worker has the ability to labor. They are going to the capital saying, here is my ability to do things. Here is what I can do if you just let me, right? Then the capitalist puts the worker on the production line, whatever that thing, whatever the thing that is being produced, whether it's a human service, whether it's it's money itself, you know, like shuffling money around, whatever that thing may be, uh, it puts them on the production line in on, on the production line of this commodity in the process of this commodity production, the worker surrenders their labor 
They give their labor. Their labor is extracted from them, but yeah. they don't own their labor. Yeah. That's the key thing. Yeah. They own their ability to labor. Yes. But once put into production, once the thing becomes kinetic, they are surrendering their labor. They are giving their labor up. And that is that is what it is to live in a market system yeah. where you all you have is your like ability to be exploited. What you own is not your labor. Because if you owned your labor, we wouldn't live in the system. What you own is your ability to labor. And what you surrender is your ability to do that. And in the process, in the process of giving your labor away, you're giving it to an exploiter. That's who the capitalist is. They are they're exploiting you. And if you are paid a dime less than you produce, you are being exploited. Yeah. Exploitation is not just, it's not a question of a quality of life. It's not a question of like, if is it is it good or bad or how harsh is it? It's just, it, it, it's a technical relationship. The technical relationship of I own the means of production. You do not, you must surrender your labor. Once you do, I could pay you $10 million, but if you are producing $10 million and a dime, I'm exploiting you. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of like that, that, that's, that's the way it is. So, so that, that's kind of, um, Yes, yes, it's the um, uh, it's the it's not a subtlety, however, however much it might appear to be. Yeah. Um, it is, you know, there's. In fact, now that I, now that I'm thinking about what you had said a, a few moments ago, I think it's it's especially uh, it's especially illustrative of the distinction. Can that I is, that I'm, go ahead. I, see, it was so difficult earlier to describe it. Um, what I was trying to say, because it was like with, without without you saying what you said and saying, oh, the labor, once once it's done, then you can really like drive the point home. Right. But when you're just saying it in the abstract, it sounds just like, what are you talking about? Well, yeah. once once you once someone says it, then you can clearly illustrate the major difference between labor power and labor. Right. Because because you don't own your labor. I mean, I'm sorry. Go on. No, no, no. It's 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 that. And I was going to I was going to I was going to I was going to underscore just a few moments ago uh, what you had said. And that is that, you know, if I, if I subtracted where I needed to have uh, added, right, then, of course, down the road, we're going to see the, um, uh, you know, the implications and the consequence, the consequences of not uh, categorizing things uh, and uh, engaging them uh, appropriately. And, and then, of course, we won't have uh, the uh, objective understanding uh, that uh, we pursue and that uh, marks um, uh, frames for us, outlines for us, so that we can arrive at objective understandings of uh, our existence uh, within uh, contemporary and contemporaneous uh, economic contexts. Uh, having said that, um, I'd like to identify then the other three conditions that are identified in this particular chapter and then uh, maybe we can make a pause and and engage uh, folks that have um, uh, you know posted. I see that uh, Karina has has um, added some some words to our discussion, and so has Garay Rodrigo added some uh, words to our discussion. But before we get to those, um, uh, there are three other conditions uh, that must exist for our lives to be uh, 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 equated to the existence as depressing uh, as this might seem to the existence of this pencil. Um, that worker must be forced to sell her labor power, i.e. her capacity to labor. And she must have the means to sell her labor. She must have time, she must have training, she must have equipment, and she must have materials. And, and perhaps this is uh, the kind of, you know, uh, uh, this, the, the distinction that, that, uh, that didn't flow from uh, the language that I used right now uh, speaks to the discussion that we were having a few moments ago. Really, you know, in a capitalist economy, she doesn't necessarily own the materials for her uh, to engage uh, in labor. She doesn't necessarily own the materials if she doesn't own the machinery, for instance. If she's working in somebody else's, if she's working in somebody else's uh, uh, factory, she doesn't necessarily own the equipment 
if she's working in somebody else's factory. Um, and the time and training that is involved in, in her capacity uh, is itself an expense, at least it was in the 19th century, is, it, is an expense that was um, uh, made um, <clears throat> by and, and administered by the capitalist class, by the political class, in order to prepare her for the role that she was going to assume in this uh, divided society uh, that we have inherited. And then the last condition, there is of course a context that makes these real and that context is one about which we learned at the outset of our discussion a few months ago. And that context is uh, uh, summarized in this particular quote that I'd like to share. That is, that definite historical conditions are necessary that a product may become a commodity. It must not be produced as the immediate means of subsistence of the, of the producer himself, or as we're talking about, herself. Had we gone further and acquired under what circumstances all or even the majority of products take the form of commodities, we should have found that this can only happen when the production of a very specific kind, the capitalist production. Anyway, so that's the um, that's where in this in this uh, excerpt that Marx reminds us uh, or prepares us for his discussion on the uh, on the um, forms of primitive accumulation. I'll stop for a moment. Uh, uh, engage you and engage others uh, in discussion or have you engaged in discussion yeah well the other the thing i wanted to like touch on was uh was um that second part you were talking about which was that you know that the that they need to know how to write and you know how to read and you know they need to have a certain level of skill training right but that skill training actually comes out of you know what's considered what is called the public infrastructure you know so much of the public infrastructure is is um is bought and paid for by our by our tax base right so we are actually paying for these things now in a capitalist system, uh, and this is not to speak against the public infrastructure. We need to we need to we need to say the public infrastructure as much as we can because of of, of you know the rules and regulations of the public infrastructure. Are, it's, it's it's a quality of life question here, right? And also because you know it's 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 the, the more we have of that, the less <laughs> the more there exists that the less there is of capitalism. But um, but 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 in a capitalist system, the public infrastructure is setting you up for your own exploitation, right? So, you know, public schools don't really actually come into really in, in vogue in the United States of America till after the Civil War, right? And what is what 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 does that mean? Well, before the Civil War, the North, you know, first of all, the country is much smaller, um, uh, and you know, before you know, before the Mexican American War, before you know, for for the westward expansion, and even even after that, and that's still that period, you know, these areas are still very, you know, don't have a large um, Anglo-American population or whatever. Um, so what we're looking at before that is, you know, a country that is essentially kind of like the East Coast, what's called the East Coast today, a little bit of the Midwest and the South. And what the South is, is really the basis, you know, where, you know, where they, you know, you know, slavery is happening, but yeah. also where, where cotton production yeah. um, comes up into the Eastern seaboard and then is shipped out to Europe, right? So the entire uh, Eastern seaboard develops um, because of the South, the North was developed by the South as an appendage, an extension of uh, of the South. The North is built by the South uh, in order for it to in, in order for it to deliver its commodities to um, to to Western Europe, to England and France primarily, right? So this is where these things go, right? And then, and and in so the North ends up developing to a point where it can actually confront the South and say, well, we're going to actually you know create an industrial system on our own. So after that, that's when public schools start coming, when, when, when it becomes very clear that the northern industrialist is going to win over the southern slave driver, right? When, where this commodity, where the, the production of where we're not just going to be a, a, a resource base for Europe. We're going to be our own producers. We're going to produce for and compete on the world market. We're going to produce our or have our own factories, our own textile mills, our own oil production, all et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That is what 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 ends up happening coming out of this war. And and so that is when public schools start popping up all over the popping up all over, you know, what, what is the country at the time. Um and so that is how these things come 
they come out of like you know they come out of the industrial world right and so you know we have people like carnegie um around that time before they you know, they really take root you know putting libraries up everywhere you have these 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 company towns where the school education and this the general store all kind of that um but you can't have a company town the size of like chicago or milwaukee or whatever so you you, you know eventually that's when you know all these kind of like all this kind of this kind of public infrastructure goes into and then you know there's a theory around that which is called social reproduction you know we have to reproduce ourselves as workers right but our reproduction comes out of our tax base but it is for the purpose that we may later so that we may develop our labor power so that we may later surrender surrender it yeah. you know so we, and then be in a position where we get a quote unquote, get a job and uh that job is the process of surrendering your labor or imbuing your labor into things surrendering your labor power yeah yeah it's um it's the the system uh, as it exists in the 19th century, the system as it was, um, uh, as it culminates at that point, uh, creates uh, a, a superstructure, a set of institutions that have the corresponding task of reproducing uh, life um, uh, as it existed in the 19th century or as it pursued life in the 19th century in the time to come so that the capitalists can be continue to be capitalist across both time and space and that workers can continue to be workers across both time and space and that time and that space might be decades might be centuries that time and that space might be a neighborhood might be a state might be another nation and so on right or Maybe fractions of both time and space might be the next 10 minutes, might be the next 30 minutes, or might be the next week, right? Might be the next bedroom, might be the next uh, classroom, might be the next boardroom, etc. So that capitalism has penetrated itself in all these spaces, and, and we then inhabit these particular spaces as capitalists, uh, uh, and increasingly as workers to ensure that these buildings reproduce themselves uh, across across time and space. Right. Uh, when we talk about time and space, when we talk about social reproduction, these all seem like very mystical kind of concepts. These all seem very like above and beyond us. Uh, you know, even to describe something called capitalism seems like very yeah. much like, it, it's almost like it, it, it when most people describe these things, it almost takes on like a metaphysical quality. They're talking about capitalism is very tricky. Capitalism is very fluid. Capitalism, you know, could do this and that, right? as though it's a person, as though it's somebody that can make decisions on the spot, right? What we're describing is a set of series of relationships, right? That we reproduce over and over again. What does it mean that we reproduce? It means that it's not a mountain. It means that it's not static. It's, it means that it's not this. It means it's a way of life that we take for granted. Yeah. We keep doing these things. It is it is dynamic it is a dynamic relationship that exists in between people it is not a mystical force that just 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 is it is yeah. not a, a a solid um uh physical reality like the mountains or the stars it is neither of those things it is it is the the relationship between us that can be changed that can be altered that can be things it's something that we can refuse to participate in it is yeah. something that it, it that, and that's why it's so important to describe things for time because it's across time and space people start thinking like star trek or they start thinking like a, they start thinking about the cosmos or some like kind of mystical kind of like you know uh it takes on a, a quality that, that that sounds like that but no no when we talk about time and space we mean that like you're born into it and uh and you can actually you can change it right um, just you did it, just because your parents did it, your grandparents did it, and you think it's the way of the world, it's just the way things are. No, it, it, it's been, it's been, it, it, it's a very important to describe it as being recreated, so you don't think it's just like um, an inanimate object that, like, you know, I, I wake up one morning and I, I walk to my desk, I wake up the next morning, my desk is still there. You think about it as your desk, as this physical thing that's there, right? And of course, you could destroy your desk, but capitalism is not a physical thing. It's a series of sets of relationships. It's how we relate to one another. Yeah. And that can be changed. We can we can get up and stop doing things it, 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 just as easily as I get up and stop coming to my desk. We can stop doing these things. We can alter the way in which we relate to one another. It is completely possible. And that's why the concept of social reproduction is not just so important because it creates clarity that, oh, this is not just 
this is not just a the world. No, this is actually a, a set of series. This, this is actually the way in which we relate to one another. But if it's just the way we relate to one another, there's a therefore there. You know what I'm saying? There's a therefore. Therefore, we can relate to another to each other in a different way. Exactly. There's um uh, as you're saying these things uh, and uh, underscoring, you know, the um, uh, the discussion to this point, uh, and even as I'm reading uh, Garay Rodrigo, uh, you know, his 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 attention to historical epics, um, I am, uh, uh, I you know, I was caught, I, uh, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't moving around the way that I'm moving around today. Uh, 50 years ago, <laughs> uh, 50 years ago uh, or so, I was, you know, <laughs> I was just making my way around around the house, <laughs> you know, stumbling every now and then, etc. Um, and so, uh, what what's really interesting is that there are folks, of course, that are still around today that were already uh, moving around, uh, were movers and shakers in history 50 years ago, uh, and are making statements like um uh that you know these last few weeks these last couple months these last couple of months are unprecedented even even in comparison to the demands and the things that we know about uh as far as as far as far as these relationships that you're talking about uh even even the demands that are making that are taking place now even even uh the propositions even the ways in which institutions uh uh, the extent to which institutions have been harnessed today uh, uh, are unprecedented. What really struck me was when I heard uh, Angela Davis uh, say this the other day. Um, that was uh, that that kind of you know uh, that really helps to underscore the uh, historical epic, uh, the historical moment, uh, the historicity. Uh, of of the moment uh, in in the ways that you're talking about it, and in the ways in which Garay is is talking about it when he makes reference uh, to the historical epics uh, that Marx is uh, that Marx wrote about. Um, your thoughts? Um, well, I don't know what Angela Davis said, so you have, you have to get to clue me into that. But um, but but before we do that, um, looking at um his uh uh. Garay's comment, he says, um, Marx said that historical epoch moves forward and cannot return to past modes of production according to Marx's economic conditions, determine aspects of society. Oh yeah, but like, you know, there, there's something there's something that we're, we're missing in this formulation and that's technology. The yeah. fact of the matter is that something something enters into the mode of production, the, into the um, the means of production, not the mode, the means. This is another important distinction, the means of production versus the mode of production. The mode of production is why things are produced, right? That's the commodity question. The means of production are how things are produced, right? Yeah. When something changes in the means of production, that forces changes in the mode of production, right? So like, I think that when we talk about the gig economy today, that's not a based on the fact that people are, are, are more, uh, precarious or more um, uh, the, the workers are just themselves more precarious and have less training or just like not as smart as the previous generations and that's not based upon the fact that the capitals are just that much greedier that much more cunning that much more conniving that much trickier no the fact of the matter is there's a technology there's a technology at play right now and the technology at play requires fewer workers on the production line it just absolutely does and then you can say well what about offshoring what about this what about that what about factory work abroad okay well there's also the, 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 the people that are producing you know abroad are not meant to pay the full price of the Nikes. They're not meant to pay the full price of the, of the commodity on the market, right? So that's that, that's kind of a different that's a different relationship right there too. And it is technology that allows you to produce a shoe in Indonesia and sell it on the American market that, that you could not have done that in 1950, right? It is, it is increasing in shipping technology is a, is, is, is a, is a quicker um, way of getting things across. It is, is telecommunications have improved so greatly that these things are now possible. The ability to communicate and the ability to 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 to, to cover ground has increased. Um, quite a bit since let's say 1890, right? Um, and so that is actually also part of the technological process. But you know, the fact of the matter is that we live in a, we're living in a gig economy and the gig economy was preceded by not the industrial economy, but by the service economy, right? And so and so that is actually what stands in between. So like, you know, let's say, let's say if if if, uh, if the industrial economy is the boomers, right? And um, the gig economy is millennials. Um, well, then the service economy was Gen X. You know, I mean, like there's something in between there, right? 
And that the fact, and it's very important because what is in between shows the trajectory. It shows this is going down. So something's going to follow the gig economy, and it's not going to be the new industrial one. It's not going to be like this. It's going. It's like this, right? So like if you look at the the, the standard of living um, of let's say what's called Gen X, it's lower than than the baby boomers, which is and then the the standard of living for the millennials is lower than it was for Gen X. And what is now Gen Z is going to be lower than the millennials. And what for follows Gen Z is going to be, you know, like, you know, Gen F. I mean, Gen, 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 Gen fucked. I mean, like, it's, 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 it's really, it's, 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 it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So, yeah, so what, what you know, the, the, the service, the, the industrial economy gives away the service economy, the service economy gives away the gig economy, the gig economy gives away to the scrounge economy. I mean, like, this is, we just keep going further and further down. And the reason that is, is because of the change in the means of production, not because the, the, the capitalists are more nefarious and not because the workers are not as capable. It's because of that. I mean, and so, like, um, and where things are today, they're not going to be in 10 years. So when everyone says, like, oh, yeah, well, you know, the people have been talking about automation for 50 years. Well, you know, they, maybe they should have been talking about for about 100. I mean, these are long-time processes. And, like, you know, and we see this clear thing. My entire life has been defined because uh, I'm born in 81. So my yeah. whole life is, is defined by the fact that there was no industrial economy to really plug into. The fact that I had to make my way in this thing called the service economy, which, we, which when I was, like, 15, they were telling me, you're going to have, like, nine jobs over your lifetime. You're gonna have many jobs. You're not gonna have one job like your parents and work there for 30, 40 years. That's not that, that's not your fate. You gotta be prepared to have many jobs, right? Now, someone born in like 91, 92, 93, they're gonna hear something even worse than, than what I heard, right? Now they're they're gonna hear that, like, you know, and, and you know what? And you know what? The 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 messaging changed. Because for my mess, the messaging I received was very punitive, right? The messaging they're receiving is much more devious because it's all exciting. Like, you know, like this is the gig economy, this is the new world. This is you're your own boss. You gotta get out there. You know, like and like so it's far more devious. Yeah. Um, because if because because I mean, like, you know, when it happens, you know, the, the, the messaging and the marketers, they don't have time, you know, the, the propagandists of the of the commanding heights of the economy, they don't have really time to adjust. They're like, oh, oh, oh well, blame the workers, tell them to work harder, tell them to get to work, you know, be real mean, right? But then after time, time sizzles in and things get even, and it becomes obvious, this becomes permanent. They're like, okay, well, maybe sell it to them like it's a good thing. You know, you're not like your parents. You're smarter. You're, you're, you're more innovative. You're an entrepreneur. This is the gig economy. Get out there. You know, like it's a brave new world. It's exciting. Right. So that, that that's kind of like the way things have kind of shifted, I would say, in my lifetime. Um, but this is all uh very obvious so this is why what bernie sanders was proposing was never going to work i mean i mean even the even the kind of cool stuff that he was talking about like with, with health care all those things some of those things very very much achievable but the the entire the, the idea that we were going to return to the economy or, or the economic programs of the new deal uh a, a, as carried out by uh you know those those major things so those major shift society is carried out by roosevelt truman and eisenhower um that was never going to happen that was never going to happen because you can't do that on the basis of, 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 of automated production. You cannot do that. What he's describing, it's not going to happen. Um, so, like, uh, whatever you think of Sanders, that that's not going to happen. That 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 ideology of returning to yeah. what once was is not going to happen. And, and 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 Gary's absolutely right. There, there's just no way we're going back um, to to um, to a to a different to that to that. We can't go backwards. I mean, like we go we go forwards, and so. In, in that, I think what we see now is that we see a lot of these like supposedly progressive leaning uh, people coming out of Silicon Valley talking about universal basic income. But universal basic income is a way in a way to um, maintain the market system without the traditional capitalist uh, worker relationship. So like you're giving a lifetime stipend, let's say, let's say it develops beyond just like a, a couple checks here and there, but you're giving a lifetime stipend. Now you have this lifetime stipend to buy the intellectual property of the capitalist. This lifetime stipend that's based on nothing, but because because the worker relationship thing is severed, but you can buy from this capitalist or buy from that capitalist. Well, that's a way to maintain um, billionaires in, 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 after that thing has been like separated. And the billionaire is the billionaire on the basis of their intellectual property. Um, and so, yeah, so that 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 that's the kind of that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that the universal basic income will lead to. It'll lead into a different type of economy, but it'll lead to something that'll also be just. I mean, it'd be horrific. I mean, like my God, the 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 they'll turn us all into like like sex slaves and jesters and stuff like that. You know, like if they they don't need us for our, for our labor power. So that's kind of like 
that's kind of where things that's where things are headed with the microchip unless unless we do what marx lenin and many others described and that is seize the means of production because we seize the means of production whether the means of production is a farm or whether the means of production is a factory or whether the means seize the means of production is the computer network control we seize the means of production no matter what that is what we do yeah. that is that's how we do it um uh, Dust asks a question or makes a request. Uh, can you talk about the growing power of finance capital, its effects, and how this relates to changing technology? That's a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> in the three minutes or so that we have left, um, I will, uh, if anybody's interested in this, I think, I think this is a really interesting question. Uh, and uh, if anybody's interested uh, in addressing it, uh, one can uh, begin to understand it, not just in terms of the uh, development of technology uh, and the changes in technology over the last 20 or 30 years here in the United States and, and internationally, but uh, come to understand the ways in which technology has been, is, is, is harnessed today to advantage uh, those who are in charge of the um, uh, the financial markets uh, and to the detriment of uh, people who uh, would have otherwise uh, harnessed uh, institutional space and their labor uh, and the labor that takes place in these uh, various institutional spaces. So, uh, and that of course is made possible uh, by way of an economic logic that, um, uh, you know, folks have been uh, writing about uh, over the last 30 years or so, an economic logic uh, called neoliberalism. Um, so if if we are to understand uh, the financialization uh, that uh, Dust is uh, uh, making reference to, we need to understand, of course, the kind of economic policies uh, and the uh, sabotage of uh, an economic system that took place in the late 60s and early 70s uh, that made uh, uh, contemporary uh, interactions and contemporary relations possible and that were buttressed and facilitated, of course, by um, uh, digital technology, right? So if, if work was going to be taken uh, or, or if labor was going to be exploited somewhere else, right, if production was going to be exploited somewhere else, uh, of course, that is made possible uh, over the last 30 years on account of uh, such things as 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 fax machines, uh, such things as email, uh, such things as cellular technology, etc. Anyway, but that's that's another that's another um, uh, that's another can of worms. Uh, uh, given that uh, we are uh, heading towards uh, the last minute in the hour, um, <clears throat> won't you uh, bring closure uh, to uh, today's? discussion matt uh well, I do, uh, yeah absolutely i will but i just want to say one last thing the, the, the only thing that makes neoliberalism possible these policies possible is the fact that there's a, been a huge shift in the means of production i mean th th it's not a, i mean the ideas of like frederick von hayek the ideas of uh, of i mean like they were along for a long time i mean all these ideas that end up getting implemented in the late 70s early 80s only happen because there's a change in the means of production like this kind of libertarian kind of like you know all versus all da da da, da that's exists forever the, the fact of the matter is that, like, you know, it seems like Milton Friedman is the one who comes up with it. He didn't come up with anything. He, he, he regurgitated old ideas, and those old ideas took root because there was a means to get them through at the time. So, like, you know, the, the, these policies and the fact of the matter that we have a derivative market that is 12 times the size of the actual gross world product emerges out of the fact that in order to save the market, because capitalism should have crashed in, like, 1988. You know, like, the fact of the matter is that we have this Wall Street propping it up falsely. Um, it, it's necessary. For the, the for, for the market system to, to thrive is necessary for it to even continue to exist um that's it here yeah i'll do a poem <laughs> here's, 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 here's the poem um i picked today uh you know out of the base of the conversation and the poem i'm i'm gonna do this one right now is um based on um based on the fact that we need to sell our labor power i did I, this came out of a workshop mm. where we were doing poetry that was kind of based on the metamorphosis by franz kafka uh, and so, um, so I wrote a poem that's kind of like chapter one of the Metamorphosis, but it also, but it has everything to do with the fact that we must work, we must surrender our labor, right? Uh, it's called Elephant. One morning, drifting in and out of sleep, like so much of life unseen, I knew this by feel alone. I had awoken with tusks. The cool air on my back, 
Reflections of gray, shards of glass. I recall the time before, splintered wood, the warmth of the sun, the daylight in my room, my limbs, my skin, the emails I recall, the emails, the knock at the door, the owner of the house, no doubt. I was certain still I could not move. Every day she berates my appearance. Every day new criticism, how I dress, when I leave, when I return, mocks how I've moved through the world. I work, I pay, I rent. All I ask in return is silence. Now the living lover who does not work, who does not pay, barks at the door, bulldog of a man, howls in my room, unsolicited opinion, more threats, more stress, work they say, dress they say, emails, do not forget your emails, I have broken the bed, I cannot get out of bed that I have broken, this is not fair, this is not right, I never was, I cannot see the light, more pounding, a new voice joins the choir of the man's, wake up to work, your emails, do not forget, reply to your emails, I am your landlord, I am your office boss, she is your landlord, Lord, he is your office boss. Hands pound, voices boom, demand, demand, demand. I cannot move. This is not fair. It never was. Demand, demand, demand. The pounding, the pounding, the pounding. Your emails, the demand of light. The door falls. The landlord gasps. The lover gasps. The office boss gasps. The office boss cries out, My God. There's an elephant in the room. Finchina. Finchina. Yeah. Yeah. What did you call this poem? Or what Elephant. do you call Go ahead. Elephant. Elephant. Wow. All right. Well, uh, it takes us back to Kafka uh, in a new light. Uh, those of us that are interested in, uh, in uh, that kind of prescient uh, literature of another epic. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, all right. See, See you soon. All right. Cool. Thanks a lot.